Live from Miami Beach, Florida, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering .next conference. Brought to you by Nutanix. Now your host, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to steamy Miami, everybody. We're at the Nutanix Next Conference, Stu Miniman and Dave Vellante. Ravi Matre is here, he's the founder of Lightspeed Ventures. Uh, Awesome VC, you've got some really terrific uh, investment, App Dynamics, obviously Nutanix, Rubrik, we were just talking about them, Cubal, a, a Cube alum, a Bromium, really doing some interesting things in security and many, many others. Ravi, welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me, guys. Stay yeah, so, uh, keynote this morning, up with Vinod, and um, impressive, thousand people almost at an inaugural conference. We've not seen that before, we do a lot of these events. They tend to be little hackathons and you know small little meetups, but it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, it is. I was I was as impressed with the with the size and the you know the energy in the audience. Um, you know, we work with a lot of startup companies. Uh, I'd say this was probably the most well attended inaugural user conference event for across a portfolio of 200 companies. Um, so yeah. So at the risk of being a little bit repetitive, uh, the keynotes this morning weren't broadcast live, but. Mm -hmm. But what intrigued you about Nutanix when you first saw their founders? I mean, describe what the first meeting was like. Yeah, I, we, we obviously work with, with lots of companies in Lightspeed, our, our entry point typically is at the earliest stage when it's uh, usually a handful of people or maybe even one person um, with a big idea, but um, it's at the, at the very formative stages. And so we're really looking for, a lot of it is about trying to evaluate the people and understand the boldness of their idea, the possibility, you know, with our support for, for those small set of people to really go execute on the idea and build, make something big. And I would say with Nutanix, uh, and I said it this morning, one of the things that really impressed us about the founding team was not just the boldness of their, the boldness of their, their idea in everything that permeated, there's lots of companies that talk to us about storage, about doing new things in the data center, but it's this notion that, uh, Taking complex ideas and making them simple is really, that's the sign of true genius. And with Nutanix, their vision from day one was to take extremely complex technology across the stack and bring that together in a way that was exceedingly simple for users. We talked about it as a partnership and we said, that idea, if they really can deliver on it and build a product that embodies that core principle, it will be disruptive to computing in the data center because historically there have been lots of technology innovations, but with respect to a company that really understands how to make those innovations easily accessible to users, there have been very few. I mean, Apple is probably the best example on more of the consumer side of utilization of technology, but in the core of the data center for systems admins and database administrators, the people who, who do the hard work, it's not very sexy. Um, there hasn't been a company in the recent past that's figured out how to make those technologies really simple and easy to use. So when we met Nutanix and we met the founders five years ago, that vision really, it captivated us. It captivated our imaginations. Yeah, so when you look at, I was thinking, because Vinod said we haven't seen a major architectural you know, innovation since Sun. And I'm thinking about what you're saying here, and I'm thinking to myself, well, what about VMware? But really what VMware did is they took something that was incredibly complicated and inefficient and made it more efficient, but it's still really complicated. And you're saying Nutanix is sort I of taking it to the next level. Yeah, they made it more efficient, but it's still a fairly complex set of tools and technologies for you know, the mere mortal to try to turn the knobs on. And, 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 and really, as we go into the future, I think Diraj talked about it, the applications are changing. They're becoming even more complex. There's more pieces to an application. You hear about containers, you hear about microservices. That just means there are more units of, of, of computing workload that a, that a single person has to try to control and manage. And so with that increasing proliferation or sprawl, you need, the challenge, the bar for creating simplicity, it gets even higher because you have that many more things that a, you know one or a few number of administrators needs to be able to manage without having to, having to think about it. 
Yeah, Stu Maritz even called it a software mainframe. So I mean, there you go. That's yeah, that I, says I, it all. I mean, we watched for so many years. There was kind of the you know disaggregation of pulling all the pieces. Start. Yeah. Everything became their uh, cylinders of excellence, or a, a you know bespoke silo uh, of pieces together. Um, and you know that they said here, it's it's not about convergence, but it's about you know totally replatforming as opposed to just putting in a layer of abstraction. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, it's interesting. The company talks about this notion of invisibility. It took a while for that 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 for me to that to really grow on me. But I think it's a, a pretty appropriate analogy in our lives. Uh, things that become invisible, that doesn't mean that we don't value them or don't appreciate them. It's just that they make our lives sort of simple enough that we can move on to the next thing. You know, and Howard used the analogy of payments. You know, Uber's made it so you don't even think about paying for cab anymore. It just happens in the background. Yeah, so w one of the biggest challenges we have in IT today is we've got kind of the, that legacy. We've got those old applications and making that migration is tough. Um, you know, I think one of the theses is coming out of this conference is if we can change that underlying, you know, substrate and make it so that it's ready for both, you know, the old and the new, it should be able to unchain us from you know the ball and chain that was infrastructure. Yeah, I, and I think one of the things where Nutanix has had a lot of foresight, I mean the world we live in today in terms of computing in the enterprise, uh, there's absolutely uh, a movement underfoot for, com for computing to move to the cloud, to the public cloud. And you have some major, major companies in Amazon, in Microsoft, in Google, um, who I think have built platforms that rightfully can support some amount of enterprise workloads uh, in the public cloud. However, uh, the way in which those companies are advocating for enterprises to move workloads to the cloud, they've set up a, a little bit of a bright line. You can't, if you're going to move the workload to the cloud, you really don't have the ability to keep, retain any, any elements of how you would manage or deploy that workload at all. You have to trust a third party to do it. And so enterprises are sort of stuck in this place where it's bimodal. They either uh, completely abdicate responsibility and put, put the workload in someone else's hands, uh, someone else's hands, or they retain it with all of the complexity that they have today using, you know, kind of technologies that are hard to manage. And Nutanix has, I think, figured out how to say, you know, those two worlds shouldn't exist with a bright line between them. Let us provide a vision of the future where, you know, you, you don't, you can use one or both of those in whatever proportion you need, but it takes a really a new piece of technology to do that. Yeah, I, I think we're going to see a real blurring of that line that you talked about, because if you listen to Amazon, they've been talking about, oh wait, no, you can pull your policies, you can pull some of your ownership pieces um, into what we're doing, so you really see those hyperscale guys trying to you know, pull over to the enterprise, just as you've got companies like Nutanix that are saying, we're going to pull the enterprise to more of that web scale model. So absolutely, you know, we've got a little bit of collision, and therefore, we have this kind of hybrid offering which is where things like XCP and Acropolis uh, can help customers because that this whole migration is one of those things that you know this is a five to ten year move as to where is the equilibrium what apps live where um, and I don't want to be stuck uh, in the past or over pivot to the future yeah that's right and I think the in the interesting thing for us is that most of the large incumbent vendors they don't have the the DNA or the wherewithal to reinvent their technology stacks to address that issue, which creates tremendous opportunity, obviously. So you used the term doom loop. I loved it. That was my favorite phrase of the morning. I was uh, tweeting out to explain to people what you meant, is this sort of incremental mindset of, you know, incremental in, 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 uh, investments, and so many examples. Um, I want to ask you, though, so some of the companies are getting pretty good, even inside the doom loop. I take a company like EMC, who was a target of Nutanix, clearly. But they do a good job, a great job, of making incremental investments to their VNX and their Symmetrics lines. You know, just bringing the customers along to the next generation, and then and grabbing companies and 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 bringing in you know tuck-ins to do you know inorganic innovation. Are we going to see another company emerge? I mean, you you saw the wave of three pars and isolons and data domains and compellents and on and on and on. Who? We got the IPO, which is great for, for you guys, for investors, but they weren't able to thrive as a public company. Do you think, do you think we'll see a, the emergence of another great infrastructure company? I think that's not only possible, I think it's very likely. I mean, you mentioned EMC, and I think they're, they're, they're a company, obviously, that's had a terrific run, as have 
many other companies like HP, you know, Sun back in the day, which 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 was mentioned earlier uh, earlier at the conference. Uh, you know, what happens is every 10 to 15 years we go through these major, we, we like to call them technology upgrade cycles. So, you know, there was a movement from mainframes and minis to, to client server in the late 90s, and then in sort of the 2000 to 2005 period, that really transitioned to the web 1.0 architecture of the data center. And here we are 10 to 15 years later, the data center architecture is fundamentally changing again. It's going through a major technology upgrade cycle, and that's because the, app, the, the way that applications behave and the way they need to be supported by the computing infrastructure is fundamentally changing. You have componentization, you have microservices, and that means that, the, that many of the traditional vendors, the MCs, the HPs, the IBM, the Oracles, they've designed the computing data center in a way that it supports the last generation of applications, where you have Maybe a web server tier, a Java, you know, Apple, monolithic application tier, and a database. Today, you've got things spread out all over the place, API-driven services. You could have hundreds of components that actually make an application. So to support that at the data center computing layer and storage layer, you need a fundamentally different platform. And the challenge with all of these legacy vendors is that to support the new applications, they essentially would have to build from the ground up. And all of these incremental tuck-in acquisitions or incremental innovations on the old data center computing platform paradigms means that you're still stuck with this, hey, I've built a, an architecture that supports, you know, largely it's sort of a three-tier application. And so um, what we see happening is that th that's what creates the opportunity for a major new vendor, a Nutanix or otherwise, to ascend and to become that next generation computing platform that supports today's Cause, applications. Because it's so ugly, you're right. I mean, EMC's yeah. got a lot of complex stovepipes. If it weren't such a radical change in the technology stack, you know, I think that would give more opportunity for the incumbent vendors to make the transitions. But we're just in a period where the, the change is happening so rapidly. I mean, you, the mindset of the, of the users of technologies, the, the admins, the, you know, the CIOs, the people who actually are tasked with getting applications out quickly and having agility, their mindset is, I can't actually do this with the same old pieces of technology that I use. I must consider the new vendors. I must consider the innovators. And that, that again is, you know, you have to get it to a period in time where, where it's sort of, we call it the innovator's mindset, where the, the users of technology sort of realize that they have to look to the new innovators, and we're in, in one of those periods right now. Well, there's certainly you no know? debating that companies like Nutanix can do very well, and we think, we think we put Nutanix, we're looking at pre-IPO, we're, we're looking at ServiceNow, Splunk, Tableau. It feels, when you talk to customers, like similar pre-IPO momentum. You know, Workday's another one, maybe they're you know, even, you know, different space, obviously. But your premise, Ravi, is that you will see a multi-billion dollar That will absolutely happen. Within your core enterprise space. Uh, absolutely. It's not going to come from Amazon or Facebook, or it's going to be your core sort of investment sphere. I, I think that will absolutely happen. I think Nutanix is extremely well positioned to you know, be one of the companies that can be you know, sort of the category winner in this new, we call it sort of the new enterprise computing platform race. Um, and, and, and yeah, there are a lot of reasons why we're sort of at that you know, unique window in time where I think a new set of category winners will emerge. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm wondering, you know, if we look in the market in general, there's kind of the, you know, what's just brand new and what's putting together a lot of pieces that were there. Uh, you know, people say, you know, uh, you know, Waze didn't create any new technology. They took a bunch of pieces and kind of built it together. Uh, you know, Uber and Airbnb are just reinventing the old model. Uh, if I look at Nutanix, I mean, things like Acropolis, it's, it's built off of open source KVM. They're using commodity components. Obviously, there's some core IP that uh, they, they have in there, but there's you know no proprietary hardware. It's you know lots of options that they choose there. Um, is, is that kind of a, a new model that you look at from an investment standpoint as to, to pulling those options together? Well, I think a lot of times the, the innovation in the IP is it goes back to the first principles of the company is in taking the incredibly complex and making it simple. I mean, if you look at Apple, they, their, their core technology innovations were not about, you know, somehow allowing, you know, video or music to be able to be streamed to a phone. It was more putting together those technologies in a way for where for the first time they became so accessible to the user that it was just intuitive. You know, Steve Jobs once said when he was talking about, um, you know, the first, um, the first, uh, iPhones and uh, and iPads. He said, with respect, and iTunes. 
he said it really gives a user, he talked about how, you know, when, 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 he was, when he was young, he had hundreds and hundreds of vinyl albums and he just, he never could play them because he had so many of them, he didn't, he didn't know where to start. And he said, these technologies finally will give a person a way to rediscover all the music that they have. Um, and I think it was the power of the integration of technologies that already existed that allowed that you know, kind of breakthrough experience to happen. That's really, I think, the analog that with, with Nutanix, I think, that we think about. It's just, there's a lot of hard technology required to make all these disparate pieces of technology come together in a way that for the user, they just really don't have to think about it anymore. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to me because some people say, you know, how many open source companies we're going to have, and Nutanix is a good example of leveraging open source in its DNA. Yeah, and, and I think open source is terrific. It, yeah. it really does democratize and bring down the over, overall cost of, of being able to have web scale computing. You know, the challenge is, I mean, you, you know, whether it's trying to bring together things like Hadoop and Spark and Kafka and Flume and, you know, I could go on, there's probably hundreds of open source technologies that one needs to bring together to have a viable solution. So the magic of Nutanix is saying, hey, we will allow the user to avail themselves of a lot of these technologies. Now they're very powerful and we won't charge the tax for using a Cassandra, but we will bring those things together in a way that you know you get an abstract at a much the higher level of, of power in the hands of a user and administrator. That adds value, so open, open source is the mainspring of combinatorial innovation in this case and, and many others, but it's the flip side of that is, you know, it open creates source. complexity. But yeah, but yes, that's right. It creates complexity, but open source is a you know a business model. We'll see, right? I mean, we talk to Rob Bearden about this all the time, and you know we're. We're watching. There, there are you know few and far between examples. You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, open source again. I do, I do think it democratizes technology. When you get to, you know, production environments, particularly when you get outside of Silicon Valley, where there just there isn't the wherewithal, the ability to hire, you know, these sort of extremely knowledgeable, you know, technologists who understand all the latest and greatest open source technologies and how to make them really work. So when you get to production environments for the typical mid or large enterprise, there has to be some vendor or set of vendors that basically brings all these pieces, orchestrates and brings these pieces of technologies together in a way where the user doesn't have to worry about what's going on under the hood. There's no other way for mainstream America, or for the world that matter, to digest these technologies. So Robbie, you and other VCs go to Amazon reInvent, you're looking for sort of that, you're look, watching that ecosystem emerge, and it's interesting to see Nutanix both embrace this sort of what we call inter-clouding, you know, multi-cloud sort of environment, uh, but at the same time, it's down the road, you can see a collision course with, whether it's VM or, or Amazon. What are your thoughts on what's going on in the Amazon ecosystem and what it means specifically to Nutanix? Well, I think Amazon is a, a absolute force to be reckoned with and they had the vision long before others about uh, you know the notion that if you could provide a functional full computing stack where all of the underlying complexity of provisioning and managing it is abstracted from the users that there could be you know tremendous value in that and uh, you know and they've continued to add you know new layers of capability on top of the core uh, you know virtual machine uh, computing component. You've got things like Redshift, you've got uh, EMR, you've got EBS. So a lot of the layers that let people, let users, and now again, think about higher levels of abstraction, and they've moved in that direction. So I think um, the public cloud and you know, enterprises using that as a place to viably run you know, much, uh, many of their workloads, I think that's, that's going to be an important part of the market going forward. Um, the reality is, uh, we're not going to get away from the fact that there are many uh, application workloads that, you know, were built five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and these workloads will continue to run for a very long period of time in enterprises. And those workloads fundamentally cannot be uh, repositioned to operate on top of the public cloud. They were designed in a world where the assumptions about what the underlying physical computing inf infrastructure would do were, were simply different. There's just a lot more variability in the service levels. There's a lot of things that are different about the way a public cloud provides computing to the user that mean these, uh, these sort of traditional workloads are going to have to run in an environment where the enterprise has some greater degree of control over the physical computing platforms that they run on. And so 
That doesn't mean that these enterprises aren't going to want to avail themselves of the cloud to the degree that they can, but it, it, it creates this dichotomy that I talked about before where there's sort of a bright line and you have on the one hand the public cloud vendors saying, hey, change all your workloads so they can run ideally over here. And you've got you know, the private enterprises saying on the other hand, well I have all these things, I, I, I can't change them in, in the immediate term, so I got to keep operating them in, in, you know, with them the way they are. And so I've got this bright line and some stuff is over here and some stuff is over there, but you, it creates two worlds. And, and I think the interesting thing, the thing to keep an eye on about Nutanix is, again, with some I think incredibly complex underneath, engineering underneath the covers, they really are you know, looking to offer a platform to enterprises which says, hey, you know, you can have a single view and a single substrate, and you basically can have workloads that run you know, either place, and we will take care of the underlying you know, manageability of that, and to the extent that the user tries to do things that you know, aren't wise, the fabric will actually be intelligent enough to guide them not to do yeah, it. Yeah, they're making a bet that, that there's going to be a need for that underlying manageability, which is a very good bet. Uh, they're also making a bet that predictable workloads will sort of stay on premises, and non-predictable workloads will go in the public cloud. That's a little fuzzier, Andy Jassy would have a little debate with that and start talking about reserved instances and all kinds of you know, things that they do around predictability, but to be continued. Um, thoughts on you know, what you're looking at? Classic VC question, you know, kind of what's, what's hot, what's exciting you these days? Yeah, we continue to be excited about, I think we're in the early innings of where computing is going and where uh, you know, enterprise applications around data, around mobility, all these areas are in, in very early innings. And so um, there's companies like uh, Nutanix, you mentioned a few others, AppDynamics, uh, Bromium, MuleSoft that are, I think, riding these waves and you know have, have long-term visions about how they can continue to ride the waves and become very large companies. Uh, we see a lot of new innovation, um, particularly in the area of data um, and how at large scale it can be used to you know, fundamentally change the way application, applica applications behave. Um, those are some of the areas that we're, we're pretty excited about. You're optimistic about. about data. I mean, you know, there's been a little Hadoop blowback, but I'm inferring from what you're saying that, that we're just seeing the beginning and it's, <coughs> it will explode. You've yeah, again, I think Hadoop's bet. another good example. <laughs> we believe that um, you know, there's a set of tools and um, higher layers of abstractions that are needed on top of platforms like Hadoop to make the, again, to make these things usable um, to the average user. I mean, Qbull's a great example. Yep. You know, this is a team that came out of Facebook. You know, they were probably one of the, you know, the largest kind of Hadoop instances at scale, and they said, you know, how do we take what we've done in a place like Facebook and, and wrap that in a way and deliver it through the cloud so you don't even have to stand up the servers so that you know, your average company that wants to have, you know, use Hadoop in some fashion can just consume it as a service. So yeah, and, and then insights for the masses, that, that's, that's the holy grail. And, and you know, we think it will happen. It's just you know, taking a lot longer than people had, had hoped, but it's complicated as we, yeah, as we said the, earlier. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the tagline I heard that really brings it home, the more data I think has been created because of sensors and internet of things and just, you know, the whole big data movement, in the last four years, more data has been, been created digitally than in the rest of human history. Right. So it's pretty stunning, <laughs> and that, that's only going to accelerate. All right, Ravi, we have to leave it there. Good time to be a VC, good time to be an entrepreneur. Yep. Great to be at the next conference in Miami. We'll be right back, right after this word. This is theCUBE.